Mum hasn't had a dress like this since before the war. Will she bring her one back? A whole trunk full. If we ever get back. Andrew in interpret Susan as being um, 13, nearly 14, and I'm 15. But it's useful being older than the character you're playing as opposed to younger than the character you're playing because you've been through that already. And I think every teenager knows the experience of not knowing quite whether to grow up or whether to cling on to being a child. The book definitely has something to say for staying your age, being a child and believing in magic. Please don't try to run. We're tired and we prefer to kill you quickly. And there's all kinds of things that are going on in a real wolf that are really difficult to achieve to make it look really organic, like the breathing, for example. It's not just breathing, you know, chest up and down. There's a whole process that happens. There's the, the muscles in the belly, you can feel them contract and you can feel the chest expand and contract and as the air goes up and down the windpipe you feel that throbbing in the throat and in the cheeks and in the muzzle. It's a, it's, it's a full body experience. We've already been through this before. We both know you haven't got it in you. Same for dialogue. Beyond just simple body language to express dialogue there's the physical manifestation of that is the breathing associated with the dialogue as he expresses himself and breathes out strongly on a word you want to feel that breath tied into the dialogue so it's not just a, a jaw talking on top of the body language there's all of that stuff coming into play like a dog what's important in the visual effects that we do particularly on this film working with live action is to make everything that we put in as a visual effect have it sit in the plate very well so we're very meticulous about making our creatures fit in to the color of the plate to fit into the intensity of the lighting when we look at the image we look at it in ways that you would never look at it uh, we like to look at things on a monitor that's blown out so that we can see if they projected it with a brighter bulb would it look different we use the term grandma's TV because it's sort of a blown out monitor but we blow it even further out we look at it blue we look at it red we look at it green to make sure that however anybody would look at it that it would sit perfectly in the plate and what that does is it makes sure that it's never different from the photography that it's sitting in We'll keep the giants in reserve and send the dwarfs in first. I think one of the most impressive pieces of work that Howard did was Ottman, the key Minotaur's head. I'd anticipated that any close-up we would do the prisoner. would have to be CG animation in order to get the amount of expression that we needed. It turned out we actually used a lot of close-up work on the animatronic head. Ottman originally had no dialogue. And, um, and then Andrew said, hey, can you maybe say this? And I'm like, yeah, let me ask, Dave, can you say this? And, uh, yeah, give us a second to figure it out, you know, just puppeteer it. Did it, Andrew's like, that's great, that's great, you know? And so then Ottman started to get more and more dialogue because I wanted to, I overbuilt the head. We've used every technique from appliance application to puppetry to mechanical heads to full foam suits, full tied hair suits, muscle suits. Before anything was shot on set, we had to find out how centaurs needed to move, how the actors needed to act on set. Our animation supervisor, Richie Bainham, took a realistic horse walk, and then he took a human, and he put the human's hips where the horse's uh, shoulders were, and tried to animate a human walk cycle to match the motion in the hips. What he found out was that the most realistic motion, surprisingly enough, is not somebody popping up and down, but somebody almost walking normally. We're pushing the realism far beyond what we've been able to do in the past. As computing power grows and grows, we're able to do more and more with the amount of hair, for example, on, on Aslan. I think he's up to something like 12 million hairs uh, that are all lit properly, that the hairs collide with each other so that you get a, a sense of volume on his mane. And the, the details of the muscles are all beyond what we've been able to achieve in previous films. What's done is done. There is no need to speak to Edmund about what has passed. 
we were desperate to find the voice of Aslan and uh, especially the animators at Rhythm and Hughes and Andy, Andrew especially. Uh, for so, mu so much we've been uh, sort of watching the film with Andrew sort of voicing his version of Aslan and he was tired of hearing himself. And Liam Neeson sought out the role. I mean, we heard through someone um, that he was very interested in this and uh, Andrew talked to him. They did sort of a test recording over the phone and uh, we played it back and it, it all of a sudden just came to life. And Edmund. Try not to wander off. With Aslan's camp, which is set in a strange rocky valley, we had these guys do a computer survey of the landscape. They actually map the whole landscape in a computer. So from that information, we can build a model of the landscape which is completely accurate with all the pavilions and tents. And Andrew was able to sort of play a part in developing what eventually we will build in that landscape, which was a hundred-ish beautiful medieval pavilion decorated gold and all different colours of sort of silk. We had to, A, make sure they were rainproof and sunproof. Even so, some of the cheaper fabrics we used in the background, they'd only been out in the sun for a couple of weeks. The crew hadn't even turned up. And you could see the colors fading because the sun was so strong at the time. It didn't hurt. It just helped to make them look more integrated into the landscape. Well, I suppose that's it then. Where are you going? get in some practice. You can do a lot in, in the studio these days, but it's never as good or as big as a great location. Finding the right location, you, often there's a temptation, you know, oh, well, it's not bad, probably would do the job, but if it's not good enough, you don't accept it, you keep looking, because somewhere not far away around the corner is going to be the brilliant location, and you have to make that extra effort and know and be confident that you'll find it. I say to Andrew, we should keep looking. And he's uncompromising in his search for the really great standards. So he's an ally for me in those sort of circumstances. And I, to him, I hope.